فعاش القلب إخلاصا وافر تتحومك الطير تحلق في ثقافاتي وتنهل من روبا الخير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his household, his companions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them, to bless every one of us, to bless our offspring, to bless those to come up to the end. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all ease and goodness. My brothers, my sisters, I'm indeed so delighted to be here once again and to be able to share something good, inshallah, with you in a way that it will be a reminder for myself and for yourselves by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, are we ready inshallah? Ah, oh, that was not loud enough. Are we ready inshallah? Okay, mashallah. Barakallah feekum. So, what we need to realize and know is every one of us is trying to be a better person. Each one of us is trying to become better in several ways. Number one, in our relationship with our maker, because we as believers realize and recognize and believe that we were made by the supreme deity whom we are going to return to one day. And there was a purpose of creation that he made mention of in the Quran in more than one place. One of them is, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah actually says, I have not created mankind or jinn kind for any purpose besides for them to worship me. When I was young, I used to ask myself, but what about football? What about everything else? I mean, you know, how can Allah say He's only made me to worship Him and that's it. You know, there's no other purpose to life. Until as I grew older, I realized that the meaning of it is, in order to lead your life in the obedience of the Almighty, everything you do becomes an act of worship if your intention is correct. And if you are to stay away from prohibition, then for the time that you are staying away from prohibition and abomination, you're actually in the obedience of Allah worshipping Him. Then I realized that, you know what? It's something very broad. I don't need to stand in perpetual prayer and I don't need to be fasting every single day in order to be looked at as a person who's worshipping Allah throughout his life. But rather, I just need to lead my life in a way that I will not be displeasing the Almighty. Then you find another verse in Surah Al-Mulk making mention of that purpose of life where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا. It is He who created death and life in order to test you who from among you has better deeds. So I need to make sure that I have the best possible deeds according to my capacity given to me by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. This is mentioned in Surah Al-Mulk and there are, like I said, many other verses that speak of the purpose of creation. Allah says, death and life is, are made because He wants to test us who has better deeds. So I'm going to make sure that I have better deeds than I had before. One might say, I'm in competition with everyone else. In actual fact, you are in competition with your old self. You're in competition with who you were yesterday. And yes, amongst us, there are some who have done much more. Some who are slow in the way they get closer to Allah. But remember, the ultimate failure or passing would be determined at the end of your life. So you need to keep going. There is a narration of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He speaks of how a person would worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for 70 years. And right at the end, they mess up in such a big way. They turn away, they become despondent. You know, sometimes it happens that a person is really uh, pious in the sense that they don't miss a prayer. They actually do a lot of good deeds. They recite the Quran. They've learned the meaning of it. They try. And then suddenly something big happens in their lives that according to them is negative. And when that happens, it's a test of your faith. You start shaking. The people who have solid faith become even stronger. Give you an example. Someone passes away. May Allah give them Jannatul Firdaus. 
someone close to you passes away, someone perhaps has an accident and they break their bones or become paralyzed. What a big test. May Allah make it easy for such people. Someone, for example, loses a job and they cannot pay the, for example, perhaps the monthly installments that they're supposed to be paying for something they might have bought or purchased. And then it's taken away from them. It's repossessed and so on. And it becomes a massive challenge. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is obviously testing us. I know of people who lose their faith sometimes and they start thinking to themselves after having been obedient for so many years, they start saying, you know what? Where is Allah? What is He doing? Where is Allah in my life? I'm sick, I'm ill, and I'm just not getting better. And I'm praying every day for the last 20 years. It hasn't helped me. I remember entering a hospital once and there was a person who was telling me, I'm considering abandoning Islam. And I said, why? So he says, because... I'm a Muslim, I've been praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for so long and I'm just not getting better. I said, well, you know what? Two things, what are you considering becoming? He says, I'm looking into this faith and that faith and he gave me a few names. I told him, I know of people in that faith you want to go into who are even worse than you. And I know of people in the other faith who are also quite sick. It's not going to do with what faith you belong to. It's going to do with the test of that faith that you have. That's what it is. You cannot say, I'm abandoning Islam because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not curing me. Well, everyone has to die at some point. Are you going to say, I'm abandoning belief in totality because people die? If that's the case, you've lost what is going to come after that death. And this is what makes you a believer. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. So some people lose their faith when they're tested and others become stronger when they're tested. You know when you have a problem? You start calling out to Allah, Oh Allah, help me. Oh Allah, guide me. Oh Allah, strengthen me. I've got an examination. Oh Allah, um, open the doors. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may or may not give you exactly what you've asked, but He will definitely keep in store for you something in lieu of the prayer that you have made. Subhanallah. So you're never at a loss. If I say, Oh Allah, help me to pass this examination, I might fail it. But that prayer of mine was not a waste. The reason is, as a result of calling out to Allah, that act of worship was so blessed that perhaps the other examination in the hereafter, He will make me pass it. And He will say, look, we might not have given you success in that exam, the mathematics test that you had that you were praying for, but we gave you something bigger, and that is the success in this huge exam on this particular day, the day of judgment. May Allah grant us ease on that day. Amen. So when we look at things, we will always understand the plan of the Almighty. And sometimes if we don't, we should be believing that there is a bigger plan. The Almighty definitely has something that we don't realize and recognize. So going back to the point I was making, some people lose their faith. Some people become strong. Some people after having worshipped Allah for so long, something happens in their lives that makes them falter. And you have some people who spent their lives in the, the disobedience of the Almighty, doing that which was against what the Almighty had asked. But towards the end, Allah gave them the tawfiq, the acceptance, the goodness, and the opportunity to turn, and they turned. They turned in such a way that they became better people. They stopped their sins. They sought the forgiveness of Allah. And you know what, my brothers, my sisters, when you seek the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't ever let the devil come to you and make you doubt the mercy of Allah. Don't ever let the devil come to you and make you doubt. He comes to you and he makes you think to yourself, I was too sinful. I don't think that Allah is actually going to have mercy on me. I think I was really, really nasty. I was really bad. No. In the same way that when a person reverts and declares their shahada, enters the fold of Islam, we believe that inna al-Islam yajubbu ma qabla, that everything prior to that would be deleted completely in terms of sin and negativity. In that same way, when you engage in tawbah and repentance and you turn to Allah seeking forgiveness, everything evil you've done or the, the things that you are seeking forgiveness from would actually be totally wiped out. Totally wiped out. So don't doubt that. Allah tells us not to lose hope in His mercy. Qul ya 
أنفسهم لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم Say, O Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, tell my worshippers Those who have transgressed against themselves, those who have committed sin, those who have done wrong, those who've involved in that which would be displeasing to me, tell them never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله Never lose hope, never become hopeless regarding the mercy of Allah. Why? The verse continues to say, For indeed, Allah will forgive all the sins that you've committed, all of them. And indeed, He is most forgiving, most merciful. Wow. So what happens is, people sometimes lead a life filled with sin, filled with bad habits. And at the end, Allah gives them an opportunity sometime in their, in their lives to actually turn to Him and to seek forgiveness. Step number one after seeking forgiveness is never let the devil come to you to doubt the acceptance of that forgiveness. By the will of Allah, I've never seen a verse, I've never seen a hadith where it says those who are genuinely seeking the forgiveness of Allah are rejected, they are turned away, and Allah abandons them. No, that will never happen. Allah loves you enough to forgive you. So no matter what you've done, just turn back to Allah. Become a better person every day. We don't want to be from among those who lose out towards the end. I think as you grow a little bit older, you start settling. You start becoming concerned about what's to follow. You know, your bones start aching. You become a little bit older and you start thinking to yourself, you know, I don't know, a brother passed away. May Allah give him Jannah. Someone else, a sister passed away. May Allah give her Jannah. I wonder when I'm going to go. Those are good thoughts. Those are good thoughts. They should not depress you, but rather they should make you become filled with concern. What have I done in order to prepare for the day when I'm going to return to the most merciful? The one who loves me the most. You know, when you're going to someone whom you love, you're not worried. You actually know they love you, but you will never do something against them to compromise that love. A lot of married people will tell you that I would never like my husband to perpetrate or to do something bad every single day against me and then come and expect me to forgive them every single day. I tell you what, with Allah, He will still forgive you for as long as you're seeking that forgiveness. People say, I sought forgiveness from a sin, but somehow I fell back into it. What do I do now? Seek forgiveness again. Well, I sought forgiveness a second time and I fell into it again. What do I do now? Seek forgiveness a third time. I sought forgiveness a third time And I fell into it again. What do I do now? A fourth time and continue. Subhanallah. It becomes irritating for us to mention it like this. But it's never irritating for Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. For as long as you are genuine and sincere. You know when you seek forgiveness, you don't say, uh, Ya Allah, I committed this sin. I regret it. I admit it. I seek your forgiveness. And you know what? I'm not going to do it again. Mm, But I might just do it again. No, there's a possibility, but oh Allah, I know you're merciful. No, you need to be strong, very powerful. Say, oh Allah, I'm not going to do it again. And keep on praying to Allah. Can I teach you a prayer that you need to continuously make in order for you to be protected from sin? Allahumma kfini bi halalika an haramika wa ghnini bi fadlika amman siwak. Allahumma ikfini bi halalika an haramik wa ghnini bi fadlika amman siwak. Keep, keep on repeating this. It means, oh Allah, Let me be content with what is halal so that I don't go into haram. Let me be, let the halal be sufficient for me so that I don't go into haram. That's a powerful dua. Allah will make you content with what is halal so that you don't look towards haram. Whether it is your spouse, whether it is your wealth, whether it is something you'd like to achieve, Allah makes you happy with that which is permissible, that which is halal, so that you don't go into that which is haram. And then the second part of it is وَغْنِنِي بِفَضْلِكَ عَمَّنْ سِوَاكَ Oh Allah! Make me independent through your virtue so that, so that I don't have to depend on anyone else. Subhanallah. For my wealth, for my health, for everything, O oh Allah, make me independent 
in such a way that it is your virtue that helped me rather than me depending on someone else. We depend on Allah alone. Now when we say this, it's important for us to realize that Allah Almighty has created people in our midst who will serve us and we will serve others in a way that we are pleasing Allah. But it's Allah who granted that to us. For example, if I have say a breakdown with my motor vehicle on the road and I don't have a jack in my car or I have one and it's faulty and I stop and it's the middle of the night and I say, Oh Allah, help me. And suddenly here comes someone, a motor vehicle and they stop and Salaamu Alaikum, they know you, wow. How come you're here? No, I need this jack and so on. They say, don't worry, you step aside, I'll do it for you. You're smiling, right? And then you realize, no, hang on, this is not Allah. This is just a human being. You say, no, 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 you carry on. I'm waiting for Allah to come. <laughs> That's what people do. And you think you're so pious, but it's Allah who says, I have sent that person to you. Do you get what I mean when I say, Allah is the one who sends someone to serve you and you serve them? That Allah placed them there. Like people getting stuck on an island and saying, you know what? We're praying that the Almighty saves us. So here comes a helicopter and two of the guys jump on and the guy who was praying says, no, you guys carry on. I'm just waiting. I'm praying for the Almighty. And the Almighty says, but I sent you the helicopter. Why didn't you jump onto it? The same applies. This person stopped by the help of Allah, the will of Allah, the design of Allah, the plan of Allah and the decree of Allah. So your faith in Allah should be renewed to say, Oh Allah, I called out to you to help me and you sent someone. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. That's faith. Faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't become despondent. It's Allah and Allah alone that we rely upon. And as we grow, as we grow, we become more conscious of the fact that we need to meet with Allah. Allah is so merciful, so merciful that we should not be frightened of meeting Him. In fact, we should look forward to the meeting with Allah, but you need to prepare in a way that you have done something at least to take forth. When you want to go somewhere, you take a gift sometimes. You take a little gift. You go to a wedding, you go to a person's house, a friend, you're going to meet someone, you take a gift sometimes. And if you don't have something, at least you know, you can show your face, you can show your smile, you know, even if you have braces and you're struggling to speak, it's okay, subhanallah. Uh, but you can show your smile, mashallah, tabarakallah, and you can go there, greet them. But when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the minimum is at least take what you were supposed to do with you, you're going to have your deeds on that day, right? You're going to have your deeds on the day of judgment. The day you want to meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will have all your deeds with you, right? You don't want to take with you that which is evil. So Allah is going to ask you, what did you bring forth? And you have a box. What's in the box? Okay. Okay, it's not going to be exactly a box. I'm just giving you an example, right? Just now you look at me and say, where's the hadith that says we're going to have our deeds in the box? Just an example, subhanAllah. To say you're going to have your deeds with you. So you have your deeds. You worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes. And on top of that, what did you do? Did you protect those deeds? So when, you, when the box is finally opened and, and the angels are taking account of what has happened and Allah in His own way is taking account of what has happened, you don't want to end up having to put your head down in shame to say, you know what? Those are my deeds. And now you're looking and you're looking down. And you're ashamed of yourself. You're ashamed of yourself. No, you want to take something that proves that you tried. You tried hard. And that's all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. He wants you and I to try hard. To do what? Worship Him alone. And respect the rest of the creatures that He has made. So there are instructions upon us that are connected to Allah. Like your prayer. Like your, for example, your song, your fasting. Your, your zakah as well, it's primarily connected to your link with Allah and then also to others because you have to give people. So the way you give them should also be very, very respectful. You know, when you give zakah, you need to consider yourself fortunate that there was a poor person that you could give your zakah to or a cause, you know, of the poor, like an organization that was perhaps distributing it on your behalf because there will come a time 
when that may not be the case. You may not find a person who is poor. And I used to make a dua some years back to say, Oh Allah, I can't wait to see that time. And I thought to myself later on as I grew, that no, we don't want to get close to Qiyamah. You know, there's a narration which says, closer to Qiyamah, you will try and give out your zakah and they will all be wealthy people. And I'm thinking, but there are so many poor people across the globe. How is it going to be that people will be rich? They won't accept zakah until I came across the Bitcoin, subhanAllah. <laughs> Cryptocurrency. I saw this and I said, okay, this is it. That's it. Imagine if everyone had crypto here today, what would have happened? Yo, if they, imagine if someone told you, I bought crypto when it was five bucks, five dollars. You're a rich man, mashallah, no more zakah, right? I can give you the zakah. It's just that it's caught up somewhere in the blockchain, you know. But I'm only giving you that example because it started making sense that Allah can change things at any time, anywhere. People who are wealthy today, use that wealth to serve a good cause. If you don't, do you know what's going to happen? A day will come when you might not have that wealth, or a day may come when others might have more than you, and they probably didn't even work as hard as you. They probably didn't. And this is Allah, His plan. He can show you that we will change everything and anything. Today someone is poor, tomorrow they are wealthy. Today someone is wealthy, tomorrow they are poor. It can happen. You need to make sure you've tried to worship Allah. Like I said, your relationship with Allah, number one. Number two is your relationship with the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have to talk about both of these. But the saddest of the people, those who are losers, those who are losers have been described in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's my topic today. And that's what I want to speak about. And that's why I gave you this beautiful introduction to say we're created for a purpose. We're supposed to be trying to earn the pleasure of Allah. The best of our days, inshallah, will be the day we meet with Allah. Allahumma ja'al khayra ayyamina awa khayraha wa khayra a'malina khawatimaha wa khayra ayyamina yawman al-qaq. Oh Allah, make the best of our deeds the last deeds. The best of our days the last of our days. And the most beautiful of our days, the day when we meet you, O oh Allah, let it be a beautiful day. Imagine, you know that you're going to meet with Allah and here you have good deeds. You've tried your best and wherever you faltered, because we all falter, we sought forgiveness of Allah. So it cancels. Cancels meaning I did bad, sought forgiveness, I can forget about that. Did bad, sought forgiveness, that's dropped. And I did good. How will that good Come with me on the day of judgment. You take a look at the verse. Listen to this verse. It appears in more than one place in the Quran. <laughs> Those who come with a good deed on that day will have in return something better than the deed they did. And they will be protected from the tremor or the shaking or the fear of that particular day. And in another place, Allah says, مَن جَاءَ بِالْحَسَنَةِ فَلَهُ عَشْرُ أَمْثَالِهَا Whoever comes on that day with a good deed shall have it multiplied tenfold. And that's the minimum. You will have your good deed multiplied tenfold. Now I ask you a question. Those of you who speak the Arabic language, when you do a good deed, what do you say? When you want someone to do a good deed, what do you say? You say, if'al or you say, i'mal. But you don't say, iti bihi. You, you say, do it, act, you know, act upon it, do it, but you don't say, come with it. In this verse, Allah didn't say, whoever does a good deed will have it multiplied by 10. Whoever acted upon a good deed will have it multiplied by 10. He uses a special verb, and that is to come with. Ja'a bishay. To come with something. Man ja'a bi al-hasana. Whoever comes with the good deed. 
That means I need to do the good deed and then pack it and keep it and hold it in such a way that one day I can come with it. Right? That's what it means. And from this, some of the Mufassireen have actually said, to do the deed is simple, but to come with it on the day of judgment is much more difficult. You might be slightly confused. Let me explain, subhanAllah. It goes back to a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu reported in Sahih Muslim, narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. He says, the Prophet sallallahu asked us, Atadruna manil muflis? Do you know who is a person who's bankrupt? Do you know the bankrupt person? So they said, yeah, the one who doesn't have dirham and mata, the one who doesn't have wealth, money, provision, uh, and assets. No assets, bankrupt. He says, wait. A truly bankrupt person is he who comes on the day of judgment. And they have lots of prayer and lots of fasting and lots of good deeds and lots of charity, lots of it. Now when you hear that much only, you start thinking to yourself, hang on, is there not a mistake somewhere here? How can a bankrupt person be one who has lots of charity, lots of prayer, lots of uh, good deeds, lots of fasting, you know, voluntary deeds, we call them nafila. But hang on, listen to the rest of the statement. He says, he comes on the day of judgment with his deeds. Before he can actually take those deeds forth, he has wronged this one, sworn that one, backbitten about that one, eaten the wealth of that one, harmed that one, perhaps murdered that one, etc. So what happens? There is justice on that day, subhanallah. Justice. You had a lot of money, you had a lot of wealth, but you owed people. So you had to start giving them bit by bit. And you started giving those whom you owed, and you had nothing left. And there were still so many people you owed. So if you look at it in deed currency, and that's the currency on that particular day, because Allah says, Yawma la on that day, the day that your wealth and your children won't help you except for those who have a sound heart. Those who come forth and they have not wronged others. Those who come forth and their deeds are protected. Their deeds are looked after. Those are the ones who will have success on that particular day. So if I've come with lots of good deeds, but I wrong that one, they're going to take some of my deeds and give them to that person. So, uh, more of my deeds and give them to the other one. More of the deeds and give them to a third one. Until all my deeds are depleted and there are still so many people whom I have wronged while I was living. This is why we say, when you commit a sin between you and Allah, the chances of forgiveness are far greater than when you commit a sin against a fellow human being. Don't we always say, your character, your conduct, your character, your conduct. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, was asked, what are the deeds that would take people to paradise? He said two things. Taqwa Allahi wa husnul khuluqi. What does that mean? The consciousness of the Almighty, you fulfilled your relationship or your duty and obligation unto the Almighty and he says, brilliance of character and conduct. Did you develop your character? Did you watch the way you associated with people, how you related with them, how you communicated with them, how you treated them or you didn't? Many of us think that, you know what, it's good for me to actually be a person who's uh, who prays, a person who reads lots of Qur'an. But we don't look at the other side of the coin, which I'm going to get to in a few minutes. So get back to this hadith. When the person's deeds are depleted, do you know what happens? There are still so many whom he owes because he has wronged them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs that the bad deeds of those people who were wronged be taken and thrown onto the scale of this person who came initially with so many good deeds. Look at that. Now what happens? He starts getting bad deeds. So the sins committed by someone else were given to me. That's not just, but it's only just if I did something to deserve them to come onto me. And that would be, I wronged that person. I back bit. I was backbiting about them. I slandered this one, I cheated this one, I deceived the other one, I lied to that one. 
Just yesterday, I, have a, I had an email and I get a lot of these where people say, you know, before I got married, they told me that my husband, well, at that time he was a husband-to-be, he had a job, he had a good salary, he had this education, he had this and that. And after I got married, I realized there was nothing of that nature. They lied. I can't believe that people actually do this. So guys, the next time someone proposes to marry, you better find out. Get authenticated, certified certificates, inshallah, to prove that, yeah, you did actually pass and you, you do have the degree, you know. I, co- I can't believe that fraud happens even in that. People cheat and lie just to get married. Come on. You're going to get caught out in this world. Subhanallah. So, if I've done something to deserve that my... That I shoulder the burden of another, then indeed it is justice. It's justice. Someone's wronged you. They need to take something away from you or they need to pay you in the currency. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us. That is the bankrupt person. Suddenly they are thrown into hellfire by the most merciful. Because if you commit a sin between you and Allah, you have four conditions. What are they? Admit your sin. Regret it. Seek forgiveness of Allah and promise not to do it again. And if that happens, it's wiped out. Complete wipeout. Don't doubt it. We've spoken about it. But the problem is, if your sin is connected to another human being, some of these pointers that I've been saying, you know, slander, backbiting, deceiving, abusing, etc., etc., then there is a fifth condition above those four, and that is, that person needs to forgive you. That person needs to forgive you. And our pride would make us not even want to go and seek forgiveness. I remember someone come to me and says, Sheikh, I'm going for Hajj. I said, Mashallah, just forgive me, please. I said, Alhamdulillah, forgiven for what? I don't think you've done it. No, you know, whatever I've said about you, I said, what did you say? Ah, it's okay, leave that, you know. <laughs> I said, but can't you tell me? No, just forgive me, blanket. I say, okay. Is it correct for you to seek forgiveness when I don't even know what you've done? It's easy for us. You know, someone say to you, sister, forgive us. You know, as they're hugging you, they say, oh, sorry, if I've said anything, I apologize. You say, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. You don't know the amount of damage they've done, actually. Had you known it, you'd have said, hang on, hang on, hang on, relax. What? Is that what you've been doing? We think it's easy. People say, just go there, just hug her nicely, mashallah, and just have a few tears. Sister, I love you for the sake of Allah. You know, anything I've said or done, I'm sure, you know, you'll forgive me. And you just want to hear the yes. And you say, yeah, done. They don't need to know what I've done. No way. Be a little bit intelligent. So I asked the brother, I said, what did you do? And I insisted. The reason is I wanted to teach him a lesson. And I insisted saying, you know what? Come on, tell me. He says, no, I just said one or two things. He says, but what did you do? He says, you know, back in the day, I used to tell people that you're a horrible guy and you're this and you're that and whatever. But I've realized that, you know, I was wrong. So I said, I tell you what, my brother, you go back and undo what you did. That's all. That's what I'm saying. And as you undo it, you are forgiven. He says, no, but I'm going for Hajj. Going for Hajj is not a license to go to people and say, forgive me and you think you're going to be forgiven. Go to Allah. Allah will forgive you for what you did against Him. But come to mankind. They may choose not to forgive you. They may choose not to forgive you. We will encourage everyone to forgive as best as they can. But there is a limit beyond which I think every one of us will say, no way. Oh Allah, deal with them. Right? We we cannot keep on saying, forgive, forgive. I mean, you slap you one, forgive. Slap you another, forgive. Break your bones, forgive. Steal your money, forgive. I'll be under the bridge here in Sydney sleeping with a little blanket and they'll come to steal the blanket and someone will say, forgive. May Allah forgive us. You cannot do that. There is a limit beyond which I cannot take it. Even spouse, those who get married, if one is oppressing the other or doing wrong, you know, you can forgive once, you can forgive twice. We encourage you. It is very, very encouraging to forgive each other. I always say, today's marriages, the first thing that goes wrong, we say, right, I want out. Hang on, hang on, hang on. You're supposed to be caring for each other, building each other, helping each other. You're supposed to be propping up each other. Your value is, is actually according to how much you're prepared to sacrifice. But I do agree if it carries on a little bit too long and if it's now creating disaster that you cannot manage and cope, you have every right to seek the dissolution of that marriage. You have every right to dissolve. But not at the first thing. 
So the point being raised here is, you cannot use or blackmail someone to say, brother, I'm going for Umrah, you know, please forgive me if there's anything I've done. If, come on, you either know or you don't know, come on. If I've done anything, if I've harmed you, if I've hurt you, did you hurt me, did you harm me, you know. Say yes or no, tell me. Subhanallah, they say, well, okay, some of us are more innocent. If I don't know you, for example, say, look, brothers, sisters, if I've harmed you, if I've hurt you, forgive me. That's fair. Because we don't really know each other. I might have said something that could have perhaps hurt your feelings. Do you get what I'm saying? Like right now, I'm, I might be standing here. I might say a thing or two. People might be hurt sometimes. Maybe, perhaps, it's possible. Well, I seek your forgiveness in advance. <laughs> That's even worse than that, isn't it? But I know you understand me. It's okay. Not everyone stands up on, on, on a podium and says, I seek your forgiveness in advance. Well, if you say yes, then you've had it. Because then I know... I'm going to come in and sort you guys out. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Let's get back to the more serious point. So, when you've done something wrong to a fellow human being, you need to make sure that as they may forgive you, it's your duty to undo what you've done. Your duty. So you go back to the people whom you might have addressed and you make sure that you tell them, you know, I said this about the sister. I was wrong. I actually sought forgiveness. She is a very good sister, etc., etc. Or... You might want to undo it in another way. You know, someone steals money from another without knowing. And this has happened. One guy was working for another guy. And as he was working, he was, you know, they were not a leaking bucket, but the till was leaking, you know. So the money was moving from the till into his pocket. And years later, he repented to Allah and so on. So he came to one of the mashayikh and asked him, he says, you know, I stole from this business when I used to work there many years ago. Now I don't know how to actually uh, say to the brother uh, or to the people, be they Muslim or non-Muslim, it's irrelevant. They are humans, you stole from them. I don't know how to say that uh, I stole from you and this is the money. So you have several people answering in different ways. I tell you the original way is to put your pride at wherever it could be. Take it out. Go forth and say, you know, brother, you worked here many, many years ago. I, unfortunately, I was young. I was a person who never had an understanding. And I stole 20 bucks from you. And here it is. I'm really, really sorry. Please forgive me. Right? That's the proper way. Listen to the silence. Why? Because it's not easy to go up to someone and say, you know, I really did a few nasty things, I'm so sorry, and so on. Yeah, you're fortunate. If you don't want to take the cash, you can actually ask them for forgiveness. But don't do it in such a vague way that they don't even have a clue that 20,000 bucks were stolen and I'm trying to look for them all over. And this guy thinks it's okay for me to just hug him and say, oh, forgive me if I've done anything. He says, don't worry, forgiven, you know, big heart. Ah, and you're excited, that's 20 grand. I no longer need to give it back. I just heard him say, forgiven. Do you know what? It's not easy for a human being to actually forgive sometimes. That's why they say the crimes you commit against fellow humans are worse than those that you commit against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala besides shirk. Remember this. Because if you were to turn to Allah, seek His forgiveness, He will forgive you. But if you ask a human being for forgiveness, they are not ghafoorur rahim, rahmanun rahim, most forgiving, most merciful. They may not forgive you. They may not. But like I say, and I'm going to repeat it again, let us, my brothers and sisters, let us make sure that we forgive others as much as possible. You know, we take cue from the story of Aisha radiallahu anha in Surah An-Nur, where Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu decided not to forgive the man known as Mr. ibn Athatha radiallahu anhu because he was spreading rumors that Aisha radiallahu anha had committed immorality. And that was the daughter of Abu Bakr. As-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And the wife of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he says, I'm not going to spend on this man anymore. I used to spend lots of money on this man. Mispah, he's related to me. He's from the Muhajireen. Yes, he's a Muslim. But he's, I'm not going to spend on him because he's so ungrateful, so much ingratitude that as I spend, he's spreading rumor about me. Imagine you're sponsoring someone to do something and they're speaking bad about you. That is terrible. That is horrible. So when Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu took an oath not to spend on this man, Allah revealed verses. 
ولا يأتل أولو الفضل منكم والسعة أن يؤتوا أولي القربى والمساكين والمهاجرين والمهاجرين في سبيل الله وليعفوا وليصفحوا وليعفوا وليصفحوا ألا تحبون أن يغفر الله لكم والله غفور رحيم الله says those with virtue those whom we've granted virtue and sustenance and provision those whom we've given value to they should not make an oath that they're not going to spend on someone because of x y and z Allah says rather embrace and forgive for indeed Allah is most forgiving wouldn't you like Allah to forgive you Allah is most forgiving most merciful you know what I learned from this if I want the forgiveness of the most forgiving I need to have within me a quality of forgiving others as well and you forgive them, alhamdulillah, as best as possible. وَلَمَنْ صَبَرَ وَغَفَرَ إِنَّ ذَلِكَ لَمِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ Allah tells us the best thing you could do is have patience. Learn to forego and forgive. It's better for you. Some people hold small things against others in a way that it becomes a bigger burden on their shoulders than anyone else's. It becomes a point of stress and depression. You haven't released. Just release it. Release it as best as you can. But... We have to admit there is a limit. We have to admit there is a limit beyond which I might say, listen, I don't want to forgive this person. Be careful. If you say, let's sort out the matter on the day of judgment. That's a very, very tricky statement. The reason is, while it sounds so good, who knows when you arrive on the day of judgment, what the reality was? What if it turned out that you were wrong? And what if it turned out that neither of you were wrong? What if? Just what if some of the detail happened to be against you? So therefore, try and sort out your matters here. Subhanallah. Such that when we get in the day of judgment, when we get in front of Allah on that day, we have these deeds. We bring them forth. They came with us. We have not slandered anyone because we didn't lose our deeds, subhanallah, having wronged someone and we brought them forth. Our bucket was not leaking. We had deeds, we filled them into the bucket and you know what we did? We ensured that there was no leak at the bottom. The reason is, let's ask ourselves how many of us, we do good deeds, we fulfill our prayers. MashaAllah, five prayers a day. Some of us even more. You know, that which is voluntary as well. And MashaAllah, we dress appropriately. We have so much of goodness. We're getting closer to Allah. We fast and so on. And we start thinking to ourselves, Alhamdulillah, you know, MashaAllah, I, I, I'm thankful to Allah that Allah's made me, uh, you know, read five salah in the first saf. I read it with jama'ah. Oh, I fulfill my, I read Quran every day. I read so much of Quran. But you know what? At home, the way you speak to your wife or your husband is so nasty that as you come out of the masjid having read that salah, you come into the home with a leaking bucket. That salah went straight through the bucket. What happened? You came home and you just said one bad word. You hurt the heart of those whom you live with. Your bucket is leaking. You've just thrown the good deed away. You have to have a package. When you put your deeds into a bucket, make sure that there's no hole with a leak, that you're losing the deeds. Many of us speak to our children in a way that we abuse them. Wallahi, we abuse them, not realizing that Allah is watching, Allah knows. I've come across cases where mothers use a statement of Muhammad to blackmail their children. And parents do the same sometimes. They use a statement to blackmail. Yes, your status is known. You know, we say, serve your parents, serve your mother, you will earn Jannatul Firdaus. Don't you hear that? You will earn paradise by serving your mother or by serving your parents. You need to be kinder to your mother than your father. Do you agree? No one's agreeing. You need to be kinder to your mother than your father. Do you agree? MashaAllah. That's a hadith. Kindness. Who is more deserving of my kindness? He says, your mother. Who next? He says, your mother. Who next? He says, your mother. 
This was the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The fourth time, who next? He says, Dad, by the way, your father. <laughs> Subhanallah. Subhanallah. That is kindness. So people say, your paradise is under my feet. You will do as I say. Huh, come on, come on. That's not what the Prophet said. He didn't say that you can use that statement to blackmail your kids. I know of a case and many cases where parents say, you know what? After Allah, you're supposed to obey your parents. And we are telling you, you're not going to get married there. You're going to get married where we say, because we are your parents. That's blackmail. Total blackmail. Haram, not allowed. You cannot use that statement to impose on your child what you believe that you should impose when Allah gave them a choice in that regard. I hope you get what I'm saying. People are doing this. And a lot of young boys and girls complain about their folks. And I think to myself, but these are pious people. These people read the Quran. These people are half it. They've memorized the Quran. These people read Salah. These people do good deeds. And look at them. They are so filthy in their relationships with their own who live in the same house. We're ugly. And the other way as well, sometimes you have a son or a daughter, very pious, mashallah, they're really trying hard and mashallah, reading Quran and doing this and doing, and they speak to their parents like, subhanallah, they wouldn't even speak to anyone else. Mom, who's mom? Mom, come here. Hey, take it easy. Subhanallah, you don't ever speak to your parents disrespectfully. There is no excuse. You might disagree with them, but respectfully. Allah says, if your parents, one or both of them, arrive at old age, in your presence, you need to know what to do. You don't ever utter oof to them. Ah, and that's a bad expression, let alone a bad statement. Respect them. I could disagree with my parents, but I can disagree in a respectful manner, no matter who they are. I've had people come to me, no, but my mother's not a Muslim. If your mother's not a Muslim, go out of your way to make sure that you respect her, you honor her, you fulfill her rights. Why not? You have to. It's irrelevant what faith you belong to. Those are your parents. Those are your parents. The only time you excuse yourself is when they're asking you to do something that is haram. They're asking you to do something that you really are not allowed to do. And you can politely excuse yourself. And you need to master the art of being polite. Because that is part of your paradise. Being polite, be good to people, be kind to everyone. We talk about character, but sometimes you have people who are hypocritical. Why? They believe that Islam is only connected to one thing, and that is salah. You pray? Yes. Ah, khalas, jannah. What jannah? Jannah? I pray five times a day. That's it. You pray five times a day, thank Allah. Watch out, it was easy to pray. It is 10 times more difficult to protect that prayer. I tell you, a lot of the guys, they'll come and they'll pray, and mashallah, they'll take long in salah and so on. Shaitan comes to them before they exit the masjid and starts making them have evil thoughts about someone else. So you see another guy praying while you're walking out of the masjid, and you think to yourself, you know what? Ah, this guy is just pretending. Look at him, he's pretending to be holy. You gotta be like me, come every day on time, guy. And come right to the front and read with the imam. Then you can talk. That very thought has probably resulted in you losing the entire reward of the whole salah that you made and on top of that earning a sin from Allah. What happened to your bucket? It had a massive hole at the bottom. Huge. Not just a leak, it was a waste. Straight down. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. This is why we say be careful. To do your deed is not so difficult. You know in Ramadan we fast. Everyone fast. Have you noticed it's easier to fast in Ramadan than outside Ramadan? Have you noticed that? Subhanallah. Why? We're doing it collectively. It's the season and so on. But have you also noticed that sometimes in Ramadan tempers flare? I always see in the communities, Muslim communities, 
you know, after, just before Salatul Asr, around just before the time of, uh, uh, you know, breaking the fast, you find the, the brothers are all on edge. Any small thing triggers, triggers. Why? I'll tell you why. It's not because you're hungry, no. They say hungry man is angry man. Yeah, it's okay. But if you're a Muslim, that's not true. You're supposed to be softened. The reason is, in the same way that when you do a bad deed, you seek forgiveness. When you do a good deed, seek to protect that deed. You follow what I'm saying? When you do a bad deed, you seek forgiveness, it's wiped out. When you do a good deed, seek protection so it's consolidated. You need to remember this. So, shaitan comes to you towards the end of the day, knowing that you are packaging the whole deed, and it's now going to go into that bucket solid. He comes and makes it leak. Why? Just before it ends, spoil it for them. So now you start arguing and fighting. That's why the Prophet Muhammad warns us of this. And he says, if, when you are fasting, you don't swear, you don't abuse, you don't commit immorality, you don't say vulgar words. And if anyone comes to try and argue with you, what should you say? In Nisa'im. Look, I'm fasting. Cut it there. Someone swears you big, big swear words under normal circumstances. You know, people who are not conscious would swear back. One day I had a boy, another factual story, who came to me and says, you know what? Tell me. Allah says in the Quran, وَجَزَاءُ سَيِّئَةٍ سَيِّئَةٌ مِثْلُهَا When someone does bad, you can do it back to them. So I've had this guy swearing me, swearing me, and I just swear back to him. I says, well, what does he say? <laughs> he couldn't even say the words. And I said, that's not true. If someone does something, you need to know the interpretation of it. If someone perpetrates a sin against you, it does not justify you perpetrating a sin against them. No. So it depends what it is. Subhanallah. The recompense of someone who did evil is something equivalent. It may not be exactly the same thing. I mean, if someone swears you huge swear words that are so derogatory and demeaning, does it mean Islam gives you the permission to get up and say the exact same words to them? If that's the case, you became equal. Yet it was par. So in the hadith of the fasting, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, actually says, tell them I'm fasting and walk away. Walk off. What did you do? You sealed your bucket, you kept your deeds. Done. Same applies to salah. When you have fulfilled your salah, shaitan's going to come to you. He's going to try and was, 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 was. You know, he tries and whisper. To make you feel like you're an important guy. No, humble yourself. Bring yourself down. You know, relax. Take it easy. When you see others fulfilling salah, pray to Allah. When you see those who don't really fulfill that salah in a proper way, pray for them. And ask Allah to give you steadfastness. You see someone outwardly not exactly how you are. Pray for them. Be good to them. Be kind to them. Don't let them feel that you know what? You're an outcast. You're not an outcast. I tell you, I pray for you and I ask Allah to help me so that I'm consolidated. I don't want that 70 year story where I do good deeds for 70 years and right at the end everything is spoiled. I don't want that. And what I'd like to see for me and you is Jannah. That's one of the things we lack. We make dua for ourselves, but when we see others going wrong, we curse them. Rather than that, make dua, oh Allah, grant them Jannah, forgive them, guide them. If you pray for someone else, the angels are making the same prayer for you. So make it a positive prayer. When you pray for someone else, the angels are making the same prayer for you. And the prayer of the angels is far more powerful than my prayer and yours. So make it a positive prayer so that you can reap the benefit of it. Rather than making it negative. You see someone, you know, you curse them, you say bad words, you pray against them. That's what we do today. One small thing and everything is over. Oh Allah, destroy them, destroy them. Don't scrunch your face, number one. Number two, don't make dua for destruction just because someone bumped your car. They bumped it. No one does it intentionally. And this is something that I always, you know, I'm always baffled about. When you make an accident, do you know what? What is it called? An accident. What is it called? Accident. We did it by accident. No one does it intentionally. So what's the point of getting angry and upset? I, I've got to tell you a story, right? So I was driving once in South Africa, in Johannesburg, somewhere near Santon, many years back. And uh, I had my family in the car. I used to drive a Toyota Corolla, you know, now I've upgraded to a Camry, mashallah. So that this little car, 
and uh, I stopped at the traffic light and some, some woman bashed into me at the back and my vehicle was filled with our bags, our belongings because we drove down from Zimbabwe to South Africa and I was going to visit a certain town where I was due to deliver a talk and that was going to happen in about four or five hours and the town was about two hours away from where I was and so they damaged my car from the back and I'm thinking to myself now what's going to happen I came out and this woman was sitting in her vehicle looking at this guy with a beard coming out of the car you know? she's just looking and I smiled and I said ah, how are you and then she said oh, okay you know meaning this is something different she expected someone to come out and start screaming and yelling you know and I didn't and I didn't I didn't and then she came out of the vehicle and she says you know what um, I'm so sorry, I'm really so sorry, I don't know what happened. And she said whatever she wanted. I said, no, relax, calm down, calm down. I said, look, I'm, I'm a foreigner here. I don't know what should happen. Tell me, what's the system? Do you know what? Do you know when I was becoming a hafiz of the Qur'an? We used to repeat verses of the Qur'an. I promise you, she knew what to do. Like, like she has repeated it about 500 times. And I just looked at her and said, I wonder how many cars this woman has damaged. Yeah. I was shocked, subhanAllah. I'm thinking, she told me, you've got to wait for the police, you've got to dial this number, they probably won't answer, but if they do, they're going to come here after about two hours. And I'm like, gosh, she's been down this avenue so many times, man. Subhanallah. Then she says, then they'll come back, then we've got to do this, we've got to go to the police, they're going to take diagrams, we've got to go to the police station, give our statements, we've got to get the insurance running, and I'm sitting and I'm thinking, wow, there's people sitting in that masjid there waiting for me. And here I am. I told her sister, it's okay. I'll go, you go. I'll fix my car, you fix yours. Goodbye. I forgive you. She was like, huh? Huh? In my mind, I calculated the damage. I thought, this is a thousand dollar damage, right? It's a lot of money, but the damage of me delaying and wasting time and waiting for so many hours for the police and the traffic being held back and so on. I still believe that in the first world countries, they should actually come with a helicopter if the accident is on the highway and they should take their diagrams and photographs from the top and then they should pluck the vehicles up and move them aside from the top. Because I'm shocked, I've traveled to many first world countries and I see one accident, someone's bumped someone and the traffic goes back kilometers upon end. Inshallah, a day will come when someone's in charge of the traffic department and they decide we're going to use helicopter, we're going to come down, we're actually going to take the vehicles from the top, clamp them and move them aside so that the traffic can keep moving. Takbir! Wow, I really hope that happens. Inshallah, it will start with Australia, Inshallah. Because it's so irritating, you have one slight tip and you know what happens? The people are delayed for hours, kilometers of traffic, jam, because of someone who knows how to recite what will happen after the accident. So anyway, I told her, forgive. Meantime, jumped into the vehicle. Oh yeah, she got my number, by the way. She said, no, I need your number, you know, just in case something happens, you know, people don't believe me. And truly so, when she got back to work, you know, she was heavily insured. I didn't know that. But... They just didn't believe that she they, thought she, they thought she bumped a wall because no one would just come and say, I forgive you, go away, you know? So, as I was leaving that place, I called the brothers where I was going that evening. And I said, listen, I've made a little accident. Someone's bumped into me. There is a bit of damage. And they said, no, don't worry. We'll wait for you. One of the brothers has a little, you know, some carry. They, they have a little panel beating place and they will do it for you. I said, oh, that's good, that's good, mashallah. So I arrived there, Salatul Asr. I dropped my vehicle off and they, they, they gave me a complimentary car. I went back, we did the muhadara in the masjid, spent the night there. At Salatul Fajr, I had like a brand new vehicle in front of me. In fact, at Isha, the brother came to me a little bit later. He said, look, your car is done. We're just putting it in the oven. And I, I thought only cakes went into the oven, but actually cars go there as well. We're just waiting, in, we just... We just uh, putting it in the oven. Now what happens with the cake? When you put it in the oven, it, what happens to it? It actually rises, right? I thought I'd come back with an SUV or something, but they gave, <laughs> they gave me back my Corolla, subhanAllah. <laughs> I needed a minivan, but unfortunately it didn't happen. But it was painted, it was done, it had new magnums, it had new lights, spotlights, everything. Wow! I thought to myself, subhanAllah, I'll get this knocked a little bit more sometimes. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. And I was done, gone. Following day, I receive a call from the boss of this lady asking me, you know, sir, 
I believe this has happened. I said, yes, it did. I said, okay, so, uh, you know, would you like us to repair your car because it's fully insured and so on. I said, listen, my car is done, repaired, everything brand new, spanking. They did not believe me. They did not believe me. Now, the reason I'm making mention of this is sometimes we need to weigh the pros and cons. You see, had I sat there and waited, I would have got my car fixed and it would have happened. And I know some of you guys are thinking, well, not everyone's Mufti Menk, you know. It's not going to happen to all of us. You're not going to say, okay, I forgive you, sister. And then you say, I'm waiting for the guys to say, I'll fix your car. Didn't happen. You know, the story didn't end the same way. But the point is, you know your capacity. You know, at that time, I was ready to pay. I didn't know someone was going to repair it. And I thought to myself, a thousand dollar damage compared to a few thousand waiting in the masjid to, to hear that I'm no longer coming. Imagine here, everyone's sitting and the guys come and say, well, Mufti Meng's no longer coming, but anyway, we've got, uh, for example, this brother here who's going to be speaking to us for an hour. What will happen to all of you? Subhanallah, damage, damage, right? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Can I tell you something that's come to my mind? I know of people, not in Australia, but I know of people who put names of mashayikh who never agreed to come, who are not coming and who were never going to come to a program just to get people to come. And then they make an announcement without the sheikh ever knowing anything about that event taking place. And they just say something happened and he couldn't come. Do you know that? So be careful. Be careful. My brothers and sisters, you're in Australia. I hope I didn't teach you something evil. But anyway, it happens somewhere. It happens in the world. You've got to, be, you've got to know who to trust here. Unfortunately, people do that with religion. They deceive. Imagine what type of leaking of a bucket they would have. They'd have a drum leaking. Imagine. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. So sometimes you've got to weigh the pros and cons and think to yourself, if I'm going to hold something, if I'm going to do something this particular way, I probably will be paying more in reality for this than I would if I just let it go. Let it go. And in that case, you let it go. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant that to us. So, going back to the day of judgment, my brothers and sisters, to do your deed is one thing, but to come with that deed is perhaps 10 times more difficult. Therefore, Allah says, whoever comes with the deed, I will multiply it by 10 for them. Now, do you understand why the multiplication? Now, do you understand why you deserve that that deed be multiplied for you? Because you kept it. I came on the day of judgment, I still have my deeds. That means I didn't wrong someone, I didn't deceive someone, I didn't eat the wealth of someone, I didn't backbite about someone. And subhanAllah, here are my deeds. So now let's go back, my brothers and sisters. From today, we become conscious of the bad that we've been doing against people. I gave you just one example of the home. Wallahi, it extends. It extends to the workplace. I know of people just because you're a boss. Hey, come here. Take it easy. You might have hurt someone's feelings. Do you know idhal al-surur? To actually make someone happy, to make someone's heart happy is a good deed according to the hadith. So imagine if you were to hurt it, break it, make someone sad, what would happen? Do you really think you're going to get away with it? So we need to make sure that we become conscious of who's around us, who we talk to and how we talk to them and what we say. What we say to them, subhanAllah, in your workplace, no matter who you are, at your workplace, at school, in the colleges, at the universities, whoever you interact with, be upon your best behavior because you don't want to lose the good deeds that you've been doing. I don't want to lose the good deeds that I've been doing. Like a person who's earning 5,000 and spending 50,000. Foolish. They're bankrupt actually. Truly, because they're spending more than they're earning. You're doing good deeds and your, your expenditure is more than the good deeds you have. And this brings us back to something. Allah says, وَنَضَعُ الْمَوَازِينَ الْقِسْطَ لِيَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ فَلَا تُظْلَمُ نَفْسٌ شَيْئًا On that day of judgment, we will put up the scales of justice. And no one will be oppressed. On the day of judgment, the scales will be there. The weight of the deeds, when I do a deed, it has a weight. It's a spiritual weight. Not kilograms, but spiritually there is a weight of the deed. It either frees me or it traps me. When I do a bad deed, there is a weight. The problem is, sometimes there are very simple deeds that are extremely heavy 
on the scale. Both good and bad. It was so easy, but it was really heavy upon the scales. I want to give you some examples on both sides, right? One is the last hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari where the Prophet sallallahu says, Kalimatani khafifatani ala lisani thaqilatani fil mizani habibatani ila rahmani subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanallah al azim Two statements. They are very light on the tongue. They are very loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they are very heavy on the scale. What are they? Subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanallah al azim we should be repeating these. They're very easy to earn reward. Allah says these words are very heavy. They are declaring the praise of Allah who is the most great and praising Allah, glorifying Allah who is the highest. Sorry, the greatest. The greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Declaration of praise and glory of the one who is the greatest. That is what it is. Subhanallah wa bihamdi. Subhanallah al Heavy. Heavy. I wouldn't have known that if the Prophet ﷺ did not tell that to us. And on the other hand, one day Aisha radiallahu anha spoke about one of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ saying, you know what, she's short. And she said it in a slightly derogatory way. She's short, you know, she's short. And the Prophet ﷺ says, you know what, oh Aisha, if the statement you uttered was ink as a droplet, it would change the color of the ocean. You know what that means? Don't say hurtful words. You don't know if they were in the form of a droplet of ink, they would change the color of the ocean. That means it's a serious statement. You heard someone, don't do that. Short for us, when someone says short, I remember flying out with someone and, and there was a lady who couldn't actually reach the, you know, the, the basket at the top. And I picked it up and put it, she says, I'm, you know, I'm short. So, I always feel I should be taller. I said, no, don't. I said, you know what? There are pros and cons both ways. I've had people who tell me I'm too tall. I wish I was a bit shorter. And then when you're short, you say, I'm too short. Relax, take it easy. Subhanallah. Be happy with what Allah's given you. Allah has given you the best for you. That's what he's done. Those who are happy, sorry, those who are tall, not happy. Those who are short, not happy. Then who is happy? Those who are medium are also not happy. They want to be shorter or taller. Then what? Those who have boys, not happy. Those who have girls, not happy. Those who don't have children, not happy. Those who have both boys and girls, it's a handful, man. So then who is happy? Be happy with what Allah has chosen for you. And you will meet with Allah with a smile. You will be the happiest person. Why? What He decreed for you where you had no role to play, you were always happy with it. If you have had a role to play and you did not play it correctly, then you have yourself to blame as well. You don't, you, you don't just say that, Oh Allah, do whatever you want. And then you sit back and relax. No salah, no zakah, no fasting. Oh Allah, if you want me to read salah, you will take me to the masjid. You know, if it's destined for me, I will go. That is foolish. Like the man who came at the time of Umar ibn Khattab, anhu, they wanted to punish one of the guys who had stolen. But he was smart. So he says, Ya Umar, Ya Amir al muminin You know, how can you punish me when it was written that I was going to steal? Smart boy, right? Smart guy. How can you punish me? It was written. Don't you believe in destiny? You know, we say it was written 50,000 years before you were born already. So it was written I was going to steal. So Umar ibn Khattab anhu says, yes, and it was written that we were going to punish you as well. <laughs> Subhanallah. Amazing, amazing how uh, we look at things. Sometimes we justify certain things where we don't play our role. And we say, well, it was written. It was written. Written. Yes, it may have been written that you were foolish not to have used what Allah gave you, bestowed upon you. Remember the example of the island and the helicopter? Same example. In our lives, Allah's given us the capacity to do things. We become lazy. We don't do things. Then we say, Oh Allah, help me, help me. But Allah says, I've given you the capacity you didn't. My brothers and sisters, I've spoken for more than an hour. And for me, it felt like I just spoke for 20 minutes, subhanAllah. So can we go on for another 40 minutes, inshallah? Wow, that's going to be another two hours. <laughs> no, inshallah, may Allah make it easy, perhaps on another occasion. Really, it's been a pleasure. I hope that we've benefited, firstly, myself to begin with. Uh, I hope, firstly, we can have our buckets. And secondly, we can fill them. And thirdly, we can ensure that they're not leaking, so that we don't lose our good deeds. 
Brothers and sisters, try your best to become closer to Allah. Let's not judge one another, but let's encourage one another. Let's not be people who look down upon one another, but let's try and motivate one another so that each one of us can work on our own weaknesses and each one of us can be people who would actually uh, get closer to Allah in a way that when we arrive on the day of judgment, we will have that bucket filled with deeds with no leakages. أقول قولي هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد سبحان الله وبحمده سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك